Glory to God. You are the situation controller. Your name is Yahweh. I welcome you tonight with a song. He's the situation controller. His name is Yahweh. Oh, wow. I've missed you guys. Oh, my God. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Just type and let me know where you are joining me from. Good evening. Thank you so, so much. I needed to take that break. Ah, if I feel was traveling and then, you know, my body was just saying, rest, rest. And my husband has taught me to always listen to my body. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your love. Yes. He is the situation controller. His name is Yahweh. And so... Is God. Thank you, Abuja, Vancouver, Canada, Georgia, Atlanta, Ghana. I love all of you. You know, oh my God, Uyo. Thank you so very much. It's going to be great tonight. I'm telling you something. Thank you. Kuwait. Oh my God. I need to go to that place. Indianapolis, Lagos, Texas. Sorry. Thank you, Ireland. London. San Antonio, Abuja. I'm reading. I miss you too, guys. UK, thank you. Thank you. South Africa, thank you. Toronto, good evening, my global family, Maryland. It's such an honor to be serving you tonight. Uganda, UAE. Ooh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. God bless you, Kenya. God bless you, Manchester. I see all of you. Ekiti, Kete. <laughs> thank you, Sheffield. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I needed to listen to my body. Thank you so much. Being in the UK, Nigeria. Yes, yes, yes. I appreciate all of you. Just share the link and invite. You know, Zimbabwe. Oh, oh. you guys are fantastic. You are too much. No, 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 you are 10 more. No, you are 100 more. Oh, Côte d'Ivoire. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Baltimore, Maryland. Egypt. What? Rwanda. My son and I are coming to Rwanda this weekend. This week. This week, actually. No, so it will be next week. But this week, this week, we're coming in this weekend. Ooh, we're preaching for Apostle Alex, the two of us. It is <laughs> going to be serious. Double grace. Yes, Rwanda, get ready. Get ready. I'm going to make a post. We're seeing you next week, but we're leaving this week. And New Jersey. Okay, everybody. Thank you. I can see Keep Germany. Wow. Poracot. Birmingham. Oh, New York. I'm coming. I'm coming. Okay, everybody. My opening statement tonight, too. Number one, I want to pray with you. It's so strong on my heart to pray with you. You see, I was reading this, the Bible today, Second Chronicles chapter 18. And the Bible was speaking about Jehoshaphat that went to visit Ahab. And Ahab said, let's go together. A relationship that shouldn't have even been at all. And he almost lost his life. Second Chronicles chapter 18. He almost lo lost his life because he went with the wrong person. I want to pray in the name of Jesus Christ that, hey, mistaken identity will not take our lives. Yes, so in the name of Jesus, mistaken identity. They were going to kill him because they thought he was the king. They thought he was Ahab. Please be careful who you walk with. Be careful where you go. You see, when you go on a walk with someone, either of these two things will happen. Either you will adjust to their pace or they will adjust to your pace. Hmm. If you go on a walk with anybody, either they will adjust to your pace or you will adjust to their pace. So be careful. That man almost lost his life. I pray for all of us today. Wisdom to know where to go, who to be with. Ah, may the Lord give it unto us. And mistaken identity will not take our lives. In the name of Jesus. That's a huge prayer 
That's a massive one for, for all of us. Mistaken identity will never claim our lives in the name of Jesus. That's the first thing that I want to say tonight. The second thing I want to say is an admonition to step fathers, step mothers, and step children. I'm trusting the Lord that I will host someone very soon that will speak on this matter. Step parents and step children. Let me start with the step parent, step father or step mother. Before you became a step mother, 90 something percent of the time, you were aware that this person that you want to marry has children. So you must have calculated, you must have put in perspective the price. The price. And then you made up your mind that you will still go with that person on this journey of marriage. Please, don't treat your stepchildren badly. Please, do not treat your stepchildren badly. It's not their fault that maybe they are mother or their father died it's not their fault they didn't wish some of them may misbehave i'll get to that you know in in a bit some of them may misbehave because they see you as oh she has come to take my mother's space my mother labored with with my father where is she coming from who is she and their body language may not be funny but please, I beseech you, that's why we call you parent, mother, or father. You are more mature, except maybe your husband is um, 30, 40 years older than you are. And you must have calculated that, well, this is a cross that you're going to bear. But please, I beg of you, do not maltreat your stepchildren. Number one, God frowns at it when we maltreat other people. Number two, you have no idea what these children can become tomorrow. Nobody knows tomorrow. We only know the God that knows tomorrow. So please, ask for grace. And if you know that, you will not be able to cope with someone that has children. Then don't bother yourself. To be single is not a sickness. It's not a sickness. Do not bother yourself going into a marriage with someone that already has children. You call it blended family. Adapted family. So if you know that you will not be able to take care of these children, please, please, please. Because the big boss in heaven is watching. He's seeing us. I'm not a stepmother, so I'm not a, an authority in this area. But by God's grace, I have an orphanage. And listen, beloved, sometimes when I have situations, I raise sacrifices on behalf of my children. And I tell God, I said it today, Father, look at the way I'm treating other people's children. My mother and I have adopted children. And I brought that before the Lord. Father, look at the way that I am treating these children. See the way my husband is handling these children that we don't even know their parents. God, reward me over my children. I still pray that prayer today. So please, this is so strong on my heart. If you know you not have the grace, you don't have the grace to be a stepmother or a stepfather, do not marry someone that has children. Let the person stay in his or her lane. Because whatever you do, you will reap. Life is not governed by miracles. Life is governed by principles. Genesis 8, 22. While the earth remaineth, seed, time, harvest, whatever you sow, you will reap. Over your children, over your own life, whatever you sow, you will reap. Please, ask. Let the person tell you, okay, I have children. So, treat those children the way you want your own children to be treated. Life is about sowing 
and reaping. It is not easy to be a step parent. I'm not, I won't deceive you. It is not easy to be a step parent. But if you have decided to be one, please do it with the consciousness of God and with the consciousness of the fact that you will reap whatever you sow. Let me wrap it up by addressing those of you that are step children. Please treat your stepmother or your stepfather with respect, with dignity. They did not cause your problem. I know there are some women, maybe it was the one that killed this one before. That's another thing. I said on this program by God's grace, I'm going to bring professionals to address this. I'm not an authority in, in this because I'm not a I'm not a step parent. But at least I know a bit about everything. So I beg of you, treat your stepmother or your stepfather with dignity, with respect. Do it with all your heart because you will also repeat, oh, hmm, whatever you sow, you will reap. If you don't want to be dishonored, you don't want to be disrespected, then don't disrespect your stepmother. I know that there are some step parents that are evil, wicked. Somebody is even saying maybe they use charms. Some are even witches. I don't know. But I'm talking of a normal situation. Normal, normal situation. Please, I beseech you tonight, do your best to honor your father's wife or your mother's husband. Do your best. And trust God that maybe you will grow up very quickly and then you leave their house for them. If a man loses his wife and he decides to remarry, it's okay. Same thing with a woman. It's okay. It's biblical. Some men don't and some women don't. But if they decide, definitely, if you're close to your parents, it will be a family discussion. You will all talk about it. And if you have your reservation about the person that your parent wants to bring in as your step-parent, then bring it up. Explain bring your reasons discuss with your father and if you know that your father will not listen or your mother will not then leave their house go and get your boys quarters and leave them i've seen things in this life oh i know and i'm not talking about abnormal and unusual situations i know there are some like that i'm talking about regular normal situation step parents treat your stepchildren very well step Children, treat your step parents very well. If you're just joining me tonight, welcome. This is Navigate with FFA every Tuesday, 8 p.m. Nigerian time. And I have a special guest tonight. I first said that I felt led to pray with all of us today. That according to Second Chronicles chapter 18, we will not die because of mistaken identity. So be careful who you company with. Be careful. Where you go, be careful who is your friend. Glory to God, hallelujah. Of course, you know, I'm a woman of faith, so my faith will always show up in whatever I do and whatever I say. Tonight, I have as my special guest this beautiful combination of brain and beauty, Debola Deji Kurumi. Um, hmm, get ready for tables to be shaking tonight. It's such a blessing, a huge one to our world. Um, Debola, are you here now? Um, so that may be your opportunity to invite, you know, invite your friends, invite everybody, and let's rock it together today. Thank you. I'm reading. Yes, DDK. <laughs> I'm reading your comments. Thank you. I've sent her. I've sent her an invite. I'm grateful that she's able to do this um, tonight. Kebala, where are you? We are right now. Jella Grace is here tonight. I congratulate you. That was a great, great event. 
on Sunday. Everybody go and shine. Go shine your light. The world is waiting. Nobody is disturbing you. The, the sky is big enough for every bird to... <laughs> yes. The table breaker. You know, to shine. Please go shine. Go shine. Go and shine. So, the Bola we are now. I've invited you. Um, and she's going to join us. While I'm waiting, thank you. Thank you for loving on her. Thank you so very much. <laughs> General. Yes, she deserves. God is so good. You see, the way God is raising women and using them all around the world is amazing. Amazing. DDK, where are thou? I've sent you the invite. Okay. Somebody go get Debola for me. So while she's getting here, you have a question. Yeah, in South Africa, I see the I see the thou at welcome. Ask me, maybe one or two people while Debola is is, is coming in. Yes. I'm letting her know we are waiting. <laughs> oh, I see Pastor Ayo Megbokwe. Now, let me tell you something. Though. Hey, January 18th and 19th, if you are a leading lady, make your way to the United States of Akure. Thursday is the dinner slash gala night. And I'm going to be bringing the world that dinner, at that dinner event. And then Friday, a full day conference it's a full day conference then saturday is the winning edge conference by god's grace i want you to please be a part of that leading ladies conference so where is debola is she here hallelujah okay can you remind the chapter i read second chronicles chapter 18 second chronicles chapter 18 we are ready. Debola Deji. We are ready. People are calling you general. <laughs> we are <at> thou. <laughs> we are ready for you now. I've sent you the request. Mm, thank you. Yes. First Chronicles. Second Chronicles 18. Beg your pardon. Second Chronicles 18. Second Chronicles 18. Okay, I'm reading your question. You just joined. Welcome. I just said, I prayed for all of us. And then I said, we shall not die <laughs> by reason of mistaken identity. Second Chronicles chapter 18, Jehoshaphat was going to die. And then I spoke to um, step parents and step children. Yes. yes, she's on the show tonight. She just got in actually because of this this they are they are lagos you know she told me this they are lagos traffic those of you that live in lagos i give it to you now well done now mm. well done what is god saying to me about women today oh what is telling me that women there's nothing he's saying that is not in the bible that women are not inferior that women are not competing with men that women should light their candles and be their best and that women should stop pulling each other down. Nobody is the reason for anybody's failure. And you can never attract what you attack. I live in Akure City, Ondo State, Nigeria. 35 minutes flight to Lagos. I'm asking your questions. That's what I'm talking. If you're asking me questions. Somebody asked about secrets to success. Canada. Oh, come on, come on, come on okay what's the secret to a good life love god be born again give your heart to jesus christ number two know yourself believe in yourself like yourself okay i think she's there love yourself don't let anybody put you down okay where's she Christian Ministries is along in Lesha Road just before Futa. That's the university in Akure Udo State. Nazan and I will be glad to pastor you. Come along. Oh, look at her. Hello, baby girl. Hello, princess. Hello, princess. Uh, 
Hello. Nice law school, but oh. it's going well. How are you doing? I'm Look amazing. At... Thank Somebody, you so much. Talk, help me love this general. That's what they've been calling you. DDK. She's there. <laughs> <laughs> See how people are loving on you. Oh, thank you, my amazing family. Mom, thank you so much for your patience. Um, everything worked out nice. I thank God. I can I can tell. Yes. See your see fine gay. <laughs> How is your husband doing? How are my children He's doing? Well. Doing? He's thank well. You. you know, we had an anniversary a few days ago. Oh. And uh, it was just uh, an excellent time of really reflecting on God's help and love and covering. It's, mm. it's been a beautiful journey. Congratulations. Yes, you said it. 12 years. Yes. Marriage. This thing called marriage. Next year, it will be 40 years hey, that I've been married to my husband. Marriage. Beautiful. Ah. Two words. Roller coaster. You know I'm very real. <laughs> It's not a bed of yeah. roses, but it's not a suit of thorns. Mm. But mm. the best thing is marry your friend. Yes. Marry your friend. Yes. Friend. Yes. True, mom. Yes, absolutely. Oh. Glory. So the next time I bring you up, Debola, you come and talk about marriage. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to. I love talking about marriage, Fantastic. actually. Happy anniversary again. Thank you, mom. The Thank longer you, you live, the brighter you will shine. Amen. Amen. Yes, amen. For doing this with me tonight. It's a yes, global family. And um, I always bring people that are on the top or people that are on their way to the top mm. to come and share with us. Because I know that success is not accidental. Mm. So, tonight, this global family is here. And we trust God to speak to us through you. Amen. Please be as vulnerable as possible. Mm so that we can learn. So let's go to your remotest past before you became DDK. Before, <laughs> before you became the general. Before you got married. Before you became a mother. Before you became a coach. Who? 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 Devana, let me say, somebody said, mommy, your lip is not red tonight. <laughs> Is your lip typically red? No, but do you usually have I, red lipstick? Because I wear red, uh, red lipstick, but lipstick. Like put on um, gloves. Because I just want to be spirit, and I you want, want to be to live, <laughs> I want to leave the beauty for Debola <laughs> so she can really shine. <laughs> you can see. Okay, you guys, be careful. <laughs> so, please, who is Debola, the mm. protest past. Mm. Tell us before you became popular. Before. Mm. Okay, so, mm. so the way I'm actually going to get into this conversation, Ma, is to highlight, um, I think, August, August 2004, Amphitheater, Obafe Wolo University. I was seated um, middle role in amphitheater. It was a conference, and the prayer we were told to pray was to cry out and say that, God, if you are doing anything in my generation, don't do it without me. And I knelt in amphitheater on, on, those concre on that concrete floor, and I was wailing and crying and praying that prayer. And it was you who had been invited to the conference. What? Yes. And you were saying to us, look, for the sake of my father's kingdom, I will do anything. And you were saying, literally, you, were, you had had a back-to-back -back set of ministrations that month, and you were changing, getting into the car, moving Ooh, so quickly, I was almost brushing, brushing on, the, yes, on, on the, the tree, on the road. Yes, yes, you said you were brushing on the road in the car. Yeah. And taught, you know, just getting ready to be here. And you said, the passion for the next generation burns in my heart. You said, the fire of passion for the next generation burns it like, you said, the passion for the next generation 
burns like a fire in my heart. And you said, I'm here for you. I came for each of you. I, you began to really pray. And at a point, even though it was a meeting for young guys and ladies, at a point you called out the ladies who felt a call to ministry. And I won't have come out, but what you said was, if there is a remotest chance in your heart, no matter how small that staring is, but if there's any part of you that has ever felt like maybe God has an assignment for you in ministry, even if you are not clear about that calling, I want you to come out. And what? I sat there, others were coming out. I was like, ministry though. But it kept growing stronger that go out, go out. And what? you prayed for us. And you actually laid hands on me. You couldn't lay hands on everybody because it was a massive crowd. But you reached out for me, laid hands on me, prayed for me. August 2004. Yes. So, so this, this feels like on you. Why are you yes. cutting on you? Right. Yes. So it's full circle. This is this is God just almost 20 years later, just sort of confirming to me that he is the author of our life's journey. And I want to take a moment to truly thank you, Mom. I want to thank God for you for the labor of love and the sacrifices you've made for decades. And those of us in our own generation who have gotten a privilege to do the Lord's work is because Matrix went ahead of us, Patrix went ahead of us. Mm. And you are one of those that have, you know, made those sacrifices to really negotiate on the behalf of generations, especially of women of, of African descent for our rise, for our emergence, for our voice not to be lost. And may the Lord honor your seed sown and multiply your harvest of righteousness forever and ever mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Wow. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Yes, mom. This is so um, I studied at Obafemi Awolo University, which is the only uh, of two universities in Nigeria. There is Obafemi Awolowo University and others. There are only two universities in Nigeria, ma. So there is OAU and then the others. I, so I... Uh, used to interrupt you. Just go ahead. The floor is yours. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I had my first degree. And it's interesting that my, my life's work, calling and assignment has sort of led me on a path of uh, sort of being in the face of the public, you know, in a measure... But I spent my days on campus being mildly uh, introverted, very serious, uh, and very, very caught to the chase, forthright, say the way it is kind of person. I'm not sure I had uh, as much as the social skills that I have now. But from when I was a teenager, I got born again in, in 1996 when I was in secondary school. And I got called to ministry in 2003, um, but actively started the work of ministry in 2004. And I mean, I was a teenager at the time. So what it meant was my path has always sort of looked like a very purpose-driven, focused, a bit too serious type of young lady. I was clear early that there was something different about me, even though I didn't know how God was going to move my life's journey, but I had always sort of been careful, even in the interactions I had as a young person. So I would say to myself, uh, when, when uh, Yahoo really just came out and we started using it uh, on campus, I would always say that I cannot write anything to anybody that if it was printed out many, many years later, when I became maybe a minister of the gospel and they will say oh see what you were doing with boys when you were younger so it really regulated me i always knew that there was something god had for me um and i've always pursued that path the biggest thing that my parents and a lot of my level of clarity about purpose very early on is connected to my parents the way they raised us is really connected to their parenting and one of the biggest things that my father has imputed into me and it has continued to mark my journey is i have such a blind focus 
I know how to mind my business, focus on what God has told me to do. I'm not easily moved by the things around me, whether achievement or non-achievement. I don't understand social strata. I don't esteem myself above anybody or think anybody is beneath me. I just know I have a path that God has ordained for me. And my greatest aspiration is to fulfill God's purpose for my life. Fantastic. In few minutes, you have shattered the table. <laughs> oh my God. So tell us about your background. Who are you before you became all this that you have spoken about? Take us to the remotest path. Okay. Uh, so I am second of a family of three. I'm the first daughter. I've got an elder brother and a younger sister. Um, and my parents are pastors. They've been in ministry for, for so many years. Oh. Um, we, I grew up in Lagos. In, I grew up in Lagos State. I would say I would possibly started off as, I don't know how, to, how the rating was in the days, but my, my father has, has always been quite wealthy. Um, even though he would say to us that, look at me and your mom, we married ourselves really young. So by the time you are, uh, by the time I'm in my eighties, you'd almost be 60 and I'm not going anywhere till about I'm 90 or hundred. Oh. So you have to make a name for yourself. You have to become someone, <laughs> something like that. Uh, and he'll joke about it. So Christian, a uh, background, uh, a bit of a sheltered upbringing, um, close-knit family, our needs were supplied, and yeah, quite uninventful. I don't think I had a really eventful childhood. Things were good, yeah, and we, we, we were led in the path of, of faith early on. I don't know if I'm answering the question well, um, yes. but yeah. School started. Okay. So um, I started off in Command Children's School in Maltu, uh, Command Children's School Signal Barracks in Maltu. And then I moved on to Government College in Ikorodu. And then I moved from there to uh, Lagos State Model College in Igbobo, also in the Ikorodu region. Um, from there, I moved to the, the only university in Nigeria, Abafemi Awolo University. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Mm. And then um, I've had executive education in um, the United Nations for Peace in uh, Sao Paulo. I've also been at um, uh, Pan Atlantic University, its social sector management program. I've been at the University of Minnesota. Yeah. Um, that's what my pastors look like. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so very much. So, you always talk about purpose. 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 You just said it now. You're focused and all that. How did you discover your purpose? I don't want to interrupt you at all, if it's possible. That's one thing. And then, have you ever failed before? Can you just imagine mm. that? Okay, uh, so I'm still discovering my purpose, but I had a very remarkable encounter in, I think, December of 2001. I got into the university October of 2001, and by December of that year, I was, uh, my, my fellowship on campus was uh, CAXA OAU, that is Christ Apostolic Church Students Association. That was the fellowship I, I attended while on campus. And uh, every time I've been asked why I have such a passion for prayer and, you know, prophetic streams, I feel like it was really groomed in that fellowship. That was one of the blessings of being in that particular fellowship because it, it forged a passion for intercession, lengthy hours of praying and stewarding God's presence in my life. Um, so December of 2000 of 2001, we had um, what was called the Sisters Weekend. It was called the Sisters Weekend. So it's, that's like the conference for all the young ladies in the fellowship. And the theme of the conference was Arise, Purpose is Calling. So we had 
this meeting, uh, they brought the guest minister, a really beautiful elderly woman, you know, well-dressed, looking virtuous, although I was wondering why she didn't have earrings on, why her hair was natural. Uh, but I was so fascinated by the aura. It was, I, at the time, I didn't understand that it was the glory of God. But I knew that I could not remove my eyes from her. She, like, so, and I, I still remember that encounter so vividly that I would always say, God, cloak me in your presence uh, and help me to live my life so much in your presence that I become a carrier and a host of your glory. And when people see me, let them see Jesus. Because I was so marked by that uh, experience. But I was gazing at her as she was teaching the word. And I remember just feeling such an overwhelming presence of God in, in the moment of listening to her. And it was as though she was radiant. Apparently, it was the Shekinah. So she talked so powerfully about a life without God not having meaning and how we had to be intentional to, to live our lives according to the dictates of God and how we can't know the way to please God except we seek him. So this meeting must have la lasted from about 7 p.m. to maybe past 10 p.m. Uh, and it held at what we call the covered pavilion. Typically, as a part one student, I, I should naturally just go back to the hostel with the other students, but I could not resist the urge to find a place to pray. So I actually started okay. praying right in front of covered pavilion. And then I felt like there were too many people passing. And so I gazed across uh, covered pavilion and I saw the main bowl and it was empty. So I, I, I just okay. jogged to the main bowl and I, I must have prayed from maybe about 10.30 to about 2.30 in the morning. And okay. all my life before then, uh, I got born again in 96. So this had been about five years of being born again. But I mean, I was in secondary school, just sort of finding my way, um, studying the Bible every night and preaching, you know, on Saturdays. But that was the longest I had ever prayed. And it, it wasn't by my strength. I was surely carried into an encounter by the Holy Spirit. And bef as at that time, I had never read Ezekiel 47, but I vividly had an Ezekiel 47 encounter. I had never read that part of the scripture, but I remember that I was, I was sojourning in prayer and I could sense that I was getting deeper. I can't even put, explain it in English, but it was vivid that I was getting deeper and going deeper and going deeper through that time of praying. And in fact, at a point, I felt like the Lord said to me to lie down and sleep. Maybe oh. I about 1, 1 30. So I laid on the on the slab and I must have I must have napped off for maybe about 15 20 minutes. I woke up and I felt full. I felt physically full. I documented part of this encounter is actually in one of my books. I felt full and I felt strengthened. So I stood up again and I started to pray. And God gave me language for some a number of the things I was praying. And I, I want to highlight three specific arenas of intercession that he led me to make. The first was I continued to cry out and I was praying about purpose based on the things she had taught us that I really want to know what, you, what I'm here for, what you've brought me on earth for and help me to live my life in alignment you know, to that purpose and that will. And the second thing I was praying about was fire. I was praying for fire on my altar. I was praying that my heart will burn for God, that I will not be cold, that I will be relentless in the pursuit of God. And then I, was, I started to pray that God should give me OAU. I don't even know how I started to pray those prayers. I was just two months in getting on campus. I was a teenager, but I started to cry out, give me this land, give me OAU. You know, give me this land and let there be revival. Let me be a vessel of revival, a vessel of, you know, just praying that way to be a vessel. And those were three core pillars of how I prayed. And after I prayed, I went back to my room. Um, at that time, I don't know if it's still that way now. OU used to be so lit. I mean, as per, as per OU now. Used to be so lit. So 2 a.m., 3 a.m., you're walking and everything is so bright. And I I, I was walking back to my room. I remember that I was going to Mose Hall. Um, and when I got to the bend 
where we had the architecture studio on the way, which would mean maybe I had, I had done about half the journey from Main Bowl to the architecture studio on my way to Moe's. Hmm. I heard um, Isaiah, Isaiah 54, I believe. I could check it out. But I believe I heard Isaiah 54. And when I got, yes, I, I heard Isaiah 54. Yes. Isaiah 54, um, and I have to be sure, but it's the scripture about how to fast. So it's either 54, 58. Isaiah 58. 58. I had Isaiah 58. And so I, I went, um, my heart was just burning like Isaiah 58, what could be there? And I went to my room. I couldn't sleep. I got to my room maybe about past 3 a.m. And I quickly opened Isaiah 58 and started to read. And he, he was talking about, the kind of fast is ordained and how to break the bounds of those who are oppressed and to serve the needy and to be a voice for, for those who have faced injustice. And so I, I read those and it started to say to me that over the course of three years, I will sh basically, I can't remember the words, but what he was saying was, I will unpack this scripture and I will situate you in this scripture and I will show you um, what your life's purpose looks like. And supporting um, scriptures in Isaiah, because I, I then got on an Isaiah journey. I'll be going to class. He will put an Isaiah scripture in my heart. What I remember with the distinct Isaiah scriptures, he started to show me they were connected to being a sharpened threshing instrument and having a mouth and an answer and being a voice of Yahweh to the peoples. So I started to see that a key part of my life's work will be connected to teaching to speaking, to prophesying, and to um, negotiating for the distressed, the oppressed, and those who have faced injustice. So I knew that I will have access in the future to maybe governments or decision-making units um, to be able to stand on the behalf of the broken and the lost. Mm -hmm. And that was how that journey of unveiling started. This was 2001. By 2002, God had then started to speak to me about what at the time was called God's Great Girls Network. And he was showing me a model for taking over uh, the daughters of God on campus and turning their heart toward him. And by 2003 was when we started out um, the groundwork for that ministry, which has morphed or which morphed after school into Deborah Initiative for Women, which morphed into Kingdom, um, Kingdom Women Global Alliance and now Kingdom Leaders Global Alliance. So that's what the journeys look like. Wow, wow, wow. Woo. Amazing. I was just glued. The Lord will preserve you, Debola. Amen. You're one of the women I've been waiting for. Mm. He will preserve Amen. you. Amen. I want to guarantee Amen. The Bible says, in Numbers chapter 6, the Lord mm. bless the earth if they yes. so he's the blesser and he's the oh, keeper. Oh, glory he to God. Keeps whatever Ooh. he does. thank so you, Lord. It is sure, nothing will touch you. Amen. The name wow. of Jesus. I'm wow. so happy. He I'm keeps so whatever he blesses. Yes, the Lord bless okay, them. Okay. Okay. Wow. Hey, so as a as a visionary leader um i noticed that you have discovered your purpose and you're still discovering of course we will continue till jesus comes but i noticed that you are you are really passionate about bringing out the best yes you know, in people i wanted to walk us through how you do this yes. mm. oh my god mom ah, Ewa, anointing ye to ask your 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 interviewing skills Marco Ziva last i've never been asked questions like this <laughs> yes, <laughs> gonna, to, yeah. <laughs> yes yes mm. the spirit of the lord is with us and i know he will pull out exactly what he wants Amen. to be a blessing to 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 our global community in jesus name so yes Amen. i'm passionate about unlocking potential 
in individuals, institutions, nations, passionate about it, primarily because I am actually not that smart. I, or I, I mean, I'm not that smart. I'm not, I'm not by natural endowment necessarily a spectacular person or an extremely gifted person. You know, there are some people who start out and, you know, even in school, they're like, oh, the most uh, likely to succeed, very gifted from like primary school. They are just so distinguished and they're, you know, <laughs> and God, thank God for, for those people. Thank God for those people. And I know every time I say, look at them, every time I would say that I'm not that naturally smart in terms of human IQ. I will have all my siblings and friends they have like never okay I, I beg to disagree it's not so you are so you are a genius what i have seen is that one of the most defining impact and that's why i don't understand a relationship with god that doesn't change you materially one of the most defining impacts of working with god in my life is how he has pulled out greatness the 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 god kind of greatness that he hid there how he has unpacked divine enablement divine endowment and i bless him i've seen him i've seen him you know turn my little too much i've seen him take the ordinary and make something supernatural out of it i've seen him unlock i've seen him lead me into vistas of vision and counsel that i could never have generated on my own so my work cuts across executive coaching for c-suite leaders in multinationals people who sit in leadership positions that i don't necessarily have material expression or experience in then transformational coaching for women across multiple spheres and stages of life. I do public policy advisory and consulting for African governments, and I've now been invited as a lecturer to an international public policy school in the United States. I'm an author of 25 books. Oh. I lead a multi, uh, a, a non-denominational ministry with presence in, in over a dozen countries and we are directly reaching as much as a hundred thousand people yearly through through um especially through the outlets and the assignments that he's giving to us and i am still my husband's babe like the guy is my g and he's my first constituency and i'm devoted to my children as my primary ministry these things are not possible by human ability no matter you know we are not custodians of independent genius at the end of the day even those who do not yet acknowledge the lord god is just so secure that is happy to unlock his glory on a life long before they have an acknowledgement of him so there are those who think that it is by the arm of flesh they are becoming who they are becoming and that they are just innately smart innately strategic but it's still the glory of God. So mm. I have an acknowledgement that God can make something out of little, that God can make something supernatural out of natural, that God can place his extraordinary upon our ordinary, and that if we submit our lives to him and follow his principles and precepts, we, we can become mighty instruments of his glory on earth because he needs earthly vessels who are on the earth realm, who can become expressions of the God kind of life. So that's just to lay a background, mom, for why I am passionate about being God's uh, vessel and vehicle of transformation for unlocking human potential that he has hidden there. And the one of the most profound, so let me now start to speak to how, because you said, how do you do it? Hmm. The first thing that God has given me such a unique grace for, mom, is that I am able to take 
uh, by, by his endowment and, and ability in me, I'm able to take spiritual concepts and constructs. I'm able to take prophetic blueprints and I can language them in a way that uh, bypasses the barriers and the defenses that people have when they're in church. So hmm. I, can, I can language core prophetic blueprints and give it a coaching expression. So you, are, you pay me thousands of dollars and we sit in a coaching retreat together. Hmm. And basically it's just that I have sophisticated language and methodology to tell you what heaven is saying now and show you step by step and a pragmatic action plan that if you do this and you do this and you organize your life this way and you follow this process, you will end up at the other side of what God is doing with his people. So of course, my, my favorite people to teach and to coach are believers because if you have the Holy Spirit on your inside, the working of the Holy Spirit upon me will speak to the to the dealings of the Holy Spirit on your inside. And that's why in my coaching retreats, people are, they don't understand what is happening to them. Why am I, why am I in a coaching retreat with a coach, but fire is burning. They'll say, Didike, what's happening to me? Oh. So it is undercover assignment. The, oh. the precious Holy Spirit will come into the room and he will begin to do an excavation. That's, I have to sometimes restrain myself from praying in the spirit and keep the conversation in English. But underneath the coaching is heavyweight spiritual work. And the Lord has put it in my heart over the course of the last five years to start to teach the church and to, and I, I trust him by the grace of God that he will give us speed in understanding his heart to really start to teach the church that this is not meant to be a unique gift. It's actually the, the modus operandi of the end time church the end time church has to be able to take spiritual capital and convert it into executive and uh, expressions you have to be able to take the endowments of the spirit that you receive in koinonia and take it to fashion huh. you, and that's why my mom for example you're back in 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 law you're getting a degree because there are some things that you may not be able to say from a pulpit huh but you can say in a committee for the federal government advocating for, for gender parity, economic empowerment, or girl-child uh, mm -hmm. uh, education that you won't be able to say, despite how powerful your influence has been and the mileage you have covered by God in, in mm -hmm. your sojourn as a matriarch. But there are committees you can now sit on and you, you start to say, let's negotiate these policies. What is happening here? As a mm -hmm. legal practitioner, these are the underpinnings you must revisit if you want to build a better society, that is why we do these things. So that is a first fundamental pathway that God has given me. Mom, with every sense of humility, the reason I am not faced by the proliferation of coaches and, if, you know, oh, is because, number one, I am a foreigner in the space. This is actively my 12th year of coaching, um, even though it's my ninth year of coaching through a, a registered coaching practice. Next year, our firm will be 10 years, and it's, it's actually been 10 years of phenomenal work. We have over 70,000 members within our tech-driven community who's, who have been a part of our programs or are a part of our programs, living in over 100 countries of the world. So I know that there is something here. I know that this is a quality tool in the hands of God for birthing transformation. So I do it through coaching. And within coaching, um, I've spoken about that conversion. I take prophetic blueprints and I flip them into pragmatic action plans, showing people what they must do with their businesses, their mindset, their relationships, their careers to actually um, trigger a shift or an upgrade. Within coaching, the other thing there is I bottle and I put NAVDAC numbers on wisdom. Kidding about the NAVDAC number. <laughs> but the idea is I'm a student of not only the scriptures, but the footprints of the spirit in my own life. By the grace of God, I, I practice spiritual archaeology. So I... I 
the Holy Spirit journeys with me in a way that he unpacks his footprints. He will show me, show you, Bashirin Rajoi, show you, got him more quiet. Do you see how you came out of this? Do you see how you overcame adversity? Do you understand how you got delivered from this paradigm? Are you, do you know why you have this much favor with people? Do you, do you see why you were able to accomplish this? Can you see how your wealth is growing? He will be showing me. Then when he shows me, he also shows me that I have a responsibility to bottle that wisdom in a way that I can, so that the journey can be easier for many others who are coming after. So I have original frameworks that are patented and I can go, I can go into a legal battle with anyone who plagiarizes my original work. I have, um, I have original blueprints, assessments that you can take and it will diagnose you properly. It will actually diagnose where you are and what you need. And these things have come from the Lord and they've come from a diligent utility. Mom, I heard you answering when I was coming in. You, you were speaking to, oh my God, so profound. And you were saying so chilled. That's the thing about you. You will just be saying it so calmly, so chilled. But they are weighty. That even when I'm listening to you online, I'll, I'll just be like, I hope these people are really listening. Because if you do this thing, oh my babe, your life will change. And you were answering someone who said, what does it take to be successful? And you started off talking about, you need to find God and you need to go, grow that relationship with God. The next thing you went to immediately is you need to love yourself, know yourself, be comfortable in your own skin. The reason I am unpressurable by anything it's I'm on pre me Terry, me the fish I I have a a joyful acknowledgement of God's dealings over people's lives, but I'm unable to actually be unsettled by anyone's success because I'm just so well established and thankfully uh, grounded in God's journey with me and dealing over my own life, and I'm pleased with the path that He's taking me. So I use, I use coaching uh, is a big tool. The second tool I know the Lord has given me is my writing. Um, even though I, I need to do so much more of it, and I, I see the Lord helping me make time in the coming days. I have about 10, 10 titles that are near good to go, and I just have to do final edits on them and be able to release them, and they're going to be such a blessing uh, to God's people. So I know God uses my resources and he, mom, you know, I've actually written um, an almost 400 page book before. I wrote it in 2019 and I wrote it in three weeks, in three weeks. Awesome. So the Lord will breathe upon my mind, you know, and what he said to me at the start of the process, I was in church that morning and he said, Debola, I want to borrow your mind. You know, you just make yourself available. It, I don't, it's not here. It's not here. He said, it's here. I'm the one that will pass it through you. You don't know it, but I want to write it through you. So borrow me your mind and your time. And I will be seated in one place writing for hours till my hand will not be able to move again. And he wrote it. So that's just to say to anyone who is listening that along the lines of your unique giftings, those are the spaces God will rest upon. Those are the spaces you will breathe upon and produce God-grade outcomes for your life and those that he has sent you to. So I use my resources a lot. And um, I want to share two more very quickly. And I know I'm saying a lot, but um, I know that he uses the prophetic ministry very strong. Um, um, God has blessed me with the opportunity of serving him in different ways. There are some people who don't know that I'm even a ministry gift. You know, uh, someone who has been on a committee with me in the work we're doing in East Africa and a man in his 50s uh, discovered me on social media painfully because that's not something I like happening often. But he discovered me and he, he then reached out to me and said, are you a pastor? Are you a pastor? <laughs> I said, um, it depends on, on what you mean by that. I said, do you preach? You preach? I said, yeah. I said, what? So that's just to say he could never just interact with me in his mind from that context because my work 
and the brilliance I demonstrate is completely on a, on a realm that is just along the lines of my policy work. But what I know is that of everything I am, what powers everything else is my call to ministry. It is, it is through my internship under Christ in ministry that he started to entrust me with other things. So it's still at the center of everything about me. And I love being a blessing as a ministry gift and as a prophet. Yes, and then uh, I, I advise governments, and that is a bit more undercover and high level, but I advise governments on their policy and their initiatives. Wow, wow, wow. What a gift of God. Woo. Thank you so very much. I still have a few questions. Yeah. So since you came in after, you know, you know where you came yes. in now. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Number one, how did you meet your husband? Ooh. Ah, I promise I want me. Oh, look at you. You see the excitement. <laughs> that tells me ah, you are married to your friend. Ah, ah. my heart. I know. Oh. Okay, let me let me let me gather my composure because uh, <laughs> oh, gosh. You know, I was saying uh, a few days ago, mom, that, and I, I wasn't even saying to my husband, so it wasn't flattery, you know. Um, I was saying to, to one of my daughters who came with her husband and we're having a conversation, and I said, a decent estimation would be, I mean, since I got married, so at least let me say, because pre-marriage, the strongest influences on my life are my parents. And oh. the, their parenting marked me. God made that choice and they surrendered to the choice in the way that they raised me and I'm grateful. But from that moment when I found the favor that caused me to be found by my husband, a, 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 a decent estimation of the impact is had in the woman I've become will be maybe about 85 to 90 percent. The person I've become, the latitude I've had, the successes that the Lord is blessing me with is, is very radically connected to being married to him. And, and what I mean is I know anyone could be like, well, there's always been God's hand on your life, you're gifted, and you've put, put his anointing on your life to use, you're diligent, and all of those sort of things that I really encourage women to do. Be visionary, go to work with the gift of God on your life, um, devote yourself to, to excellent living, um, to study all of that, be a woman of prayer, you know, avoid drama and avoid tra trauma, face your lane and mind your business and raise your family and do the right things under God. And anyone can say, oh, you have those things going. You're living your life with wisdom. But why would you still say that? I would say that because no matter how gifted, anointed, empowered, courageous, visionary you are, if you are set in the wrong context, and I know this not based on just head knowledge, mom, I'm counseling with women, as I will be looking at them, I will be saying to myself, we are so alike in wiring, in signature, in life's calling, but they are so caged and they have shrunk so badly because they've been placed in the wrong, um, um, in the wrong context. There is a Yoruba coinage that I'm going to say because I always do this. I know it's a global community. I would explain to them in English and I think you're going to, you're going to love it. Uh, and it was a friend of mine on, uh, when I was on campus that used to say it. I think it's so profound. He would say, Obo, niskil, igilo sumogi. So the, at the end of the day, no monkey is that dexterous. It's because the, the, the trees are proximate. No monkey is that dexterous. No fish is that exceptional. Take it out of water. No bird is that powerful and can glide so effectively. Put it in water. At the end of the day, the whole concept of habitats for animal life is mm. that there is a unique context 
that causes the environment to speak to the seed of greatness on their inside. Oh. So my husband is is the is is the god ordained context that allows my greatness to be unlocked you know so beyond the fact that we have a, a solid friendship i'm greatly attracted to him and he feels the same way and we've grown through seasons together and we share a very powerful uh bond of intimacy on many levels the other way that I describe what we share is that we work, Emma. We just fit in nicely. We work. The thing just clicks and it just works. You know, I work well for him. He works well for me. He can handle my type of weirdness. You know, he's, he's the calming effect to my energy. It's the voice of reason to my pace. Um, I, I keep him aspirational. I, you know, support and encourage him. I am his hype woman. I don't think he pays enough for it, but we're still working on the on the financial package, you know. But we work. How did we meet? Ah, see what DJ has done. I've even forgotten the question. I'm collecting extra sheet. But yes. Um, so we met. Uh, we went to OU together, and I have to tell you something, Mom. I'm good. This gist is so sweet. It's so sweet that when I come and see you in a current, hey, you tomorrow for mini snail, you will still give me pet pet snail to give you the inside life of the gist, but they are breached version. Okay. Um, okay. I had just experienced a breakup in, in my final year, and it was a really emotionally turbulent uh, breakup. It was close to my exams. That was my first and uh, only relationship I'd ever had. So I had never been served breakfast. I didn't understand. I didn't really understand how it worked. So I went to my classmate, but who was also like my school mother. Weird. You, you know, she was my classmate, but she was also such a nurturer. And she loved me so much and uh, thought I was such a great person. I've always had people who really think I'm superb, which is just the favor of God because it's God that really just covers us. Anyway. I went to her, ah, oh, dear I said, I'm coming. And then I got there, started crying on her bed. You know, and she was laughing at me. That, ah, she had a heartbreak. They do strong woman of God think something like this. So she went to the kitchenette, is what we call it. And she was making a meal for me. She was making spaghetti, spicy spaghetti. And she, was, she had put suya in it, bought suya. She was like, my worry, I will take care of you. When you are, when you are well fed, you will forget everything. So I laid on her bed. Her name is Bukes Salu. She's still in my life. She's still my sister. So I laid on her bed waiting for the spaghetti and I sort of slept off. When I turned and uh, I turned just waking up, there was a guy who was seated opposite me. So I'm startled like, but why are you in a lady's room? I just go seated in front of someone sleeping. So I was like, who are you? And I was like, oh, he's sorry that he came to see Bukes. I'm Bukes' friend and she's seen me. So... You know, I, I, so yeah, I didn't have a conversation. I thought he was frowning. He didn't really have a warm aura, just was with his phone. So Bukes um, asked if he wanted spaghetti, but I think he was quite shy because I was keeping such a straight face. So I was like, no, it's good. Ah, why now? Joe now he said, no, 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 he doesn't want anything. That He just wanted to see her, greet her. So he left. After he left, I said to Bukes, this guy that I've been seeing him around and, you know, the way he's always behaving, that's... He's, he's snobbish and he doesn't have a very warm or playful type of aura. And Booker said to me, Debola, you don't know if now your husband be that. You just they talk. You when they just break your heart. You know, no, they do like that. You don't know what God won't do. That guy was Deji Kurumi. So I was like, Ooh. I can't even marry a student that is my mate, that me. I'm going to marry someone that is like 10 years older because my wisdom, it took past all these small, small boys. But she said, you know, no, it's not your husband. Then why could they talk like that? So that was quite an encounter. Um, after I graduated, I came back to school. He was uh, staying back, pastoring with um, my spiritual father. So when I would come back to school, to church, I would see him there. And one of those days, we got into a conversation. I thought he, he had a different aura. He smelled really nice. I was like, ah, this guy is, is quite cool and he's a fine boy. Oh. And yeah, I went back to Lagos. 
uh, started working and was minding my business. And then, then I'm, I'm going to have to summarize it because so many beautiful things happen in the middle. But I started to work. I was focusing. So when I uh, got into Lagos, I was getting asked out by a lot of people, you know, and I'm fine. So that's also an issue here and there. So I was getting so many people asking me out. And then I went to the Lord to pray. And, and the word I received was uh, being asked out, being proposed to by many guys is actually a problem. And it shows that it could be, the sense I got was, it was a sign that I wasn't about my father's business. That if you're on the path of purpose, you have to become so focused on that path God will have to, the word he used was as though God would have to distract you to show you your husband. And he said, that's how I want you to be. He said, I want to be the one who announces your husband to you. Don't be saying, oh, is it this one? Is it that one? And he said, carry yourself as one who is espoused. You know, the way you carry yourself if you were in a relationship, he said, carry yourself that way. And you know, these kind of things are risky because on my parents' side, they are saying, your standards are too high. You know, go out, you are here, that you are single. You know, I you, go, go and visit people. So imagine God then saying to me, be so focused on my purpose. And that was when he taught me that the purpose of singleness is the singleness of purpose. So he said, carry yourself as though you are espoused become unavailable and focus on my purpose and that's what i started to do and then about a year down the line by himself he started to say to me it's time so i will wake up every day at that time 2 a.m and i there was this uh confession book by pastor delio shumakinde maybe about 60 pages of a small confession book and the assignment was just to read to confess that book from back to back. And that would take me about an hour and a half to two hours. So I would be up at, I think two or three, and then I would do it till four or five. And, and it didn't really even have marriage prayers. It, it had destiny prayers, alignment prayers, vision prayers. So I would take it from morning, uh, from beginning till end and declare, I declare I'm the next significant uh, voice of transmission in my generation. I have access to the resources and I would declare those things. One night I had finished declaring and there was remaining coke in my fridge that I thought, let me just use it to step down the declaration. So I picked the coke and I lifted it. As I started to go up, I vividly heard Deji Kumi. And, and the moment I heard, I started to laugh because in my spirit, I had a definitive understanding that that was the name of my husband. So I laughed so much and I was like, ah, wow. So Bobo in my fell last last, that kind of thing. So I, I went to check him out on Facebook because we hadn't sp spoken in a while. Uh, and I, I, all I felt, he said that my story, my, my remembrance is inaccurate. But what I remember seeing on his Facebook was a lot of Manchester, you know, football. And I was like, eh? For the kind of great destiny God has given me. Is it for but this man is not sounding spiritual though? Me that I thought I'll be touring the nations with my evangelist husband. And then we entered the same bus, maybe like a week after. And that's how the journey led on to uh getting a proposal. Wow, wow, wow. Yes, yes. Wow, 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 wow. Woo. If I ask the last okay, the second to the last question, I must meet the Yes. You tell him yes yes <laughs> yes it's done so somebody asks what did you study in the university oh my first degree is in estate management oh, that is like real estate wow. yes woo, woo, woo. and okay. i'm still very passionate about real estate yeah fantastic have you ever failed before mm. have i ever failed ha. So I know the way I'm thinking, you're going to wonder like, ah, have you now like had it all rosy? But the reason I'm struggling is because with every difficult or uncomfortable experience of failure, uh, I would draw so much lessons from it that I sort of bounce back out of it um, a stronger, more powerful person. So, so yes, yes, 
I've failed. Uh, I've failed. Um, Have you ever been criticized before? Ah. Uh, <laughs> and how do you cope? Okay. So we criticism. You know, I already shared something with you, mom, about the fact that I know they too hear. I know they too see. My road is set before me. My path is ahead of me. Then the other thing is that or on Sabbath do me. <laughs> I e you know they too pinch enter like that, and it's because I have a protocol. Have I ever been criticized? Absolutely. Likely on this call, I'm even getting criticized. Very possible that. Why is this not sounding confident? Purpose. It's likely happening. So, um, but I will share the, the strongest context where I have had the greatest conflict uh, or inner dissonance, you know, misunderstanding. The first will be in the context of building businesses. Building businesses is likely the arena of the greatest or one of the top three greatest tests of faith that I have had in my life. Now, this is interesting because I actually now have very solid teams across my businesses that I'm so grateful for. And I have many people sort of looking at our, our own organizations and saying, DDK, how do you do it? How are you this kind of leader that has the dedication, the loyalty of your people. Um, but I mean, it's been about a, a decade of building from ground up. And I have worked with, so one of my top three personal core values that is deeply entrenched into my wiring, my heart, my conviction, my lifestyle is excellence. So I find that it stresses people. And of course, I have also just learned over the course of maybe the last two years to be more mature, uh, to be more patient with the, the growth journey that people are on till they really also um, attain a, a higher level of mastery. But yes, I'm passionate about excellence. I don't understand mediocrity. Mediocrity is about the one of the few things that's ever made me cry so badly you know cry with phlegm and it's not that you are grieving over is is a thing that i grieve over i will see some people's work and i will be like ah, ah, how like how is how is this your work don't you know that your work is your personal brand so surely i'm certain that there i have worked with people who surely misunderstood me because my standards were high, are still high, but I'm a different person in sort of nurturing the journey people take. And that's been a path God has led me on in the last two to three years. And it's, it's changed so many things. So um, I'm sure that there are people who followed me in ministry, that happened a lot, and then they will come work in my organization. And I'm just like, you. no, not, I laid hands on you, you fell under the anointing. This is Monday morning, do an excellent job. So I, I have never been someone who will be rude to you, be unkind with words, or make a public showdown and insult you. But I like what I like. So you can work on a proposal with me 30 times, and you will keep going back. You, it's not well done. It's not well done. And I know that can be very frustrating for people. So I've likely been significantly criticized as being a woman of faith, a ministry gift, who is also very forthright and high standards and you know not it will come across as maybe you're not kind or you're not motherly so i would also even say that i'm not your mother actually when we get to work i'm your ceo and we're running a business we want to transform africa and we have to be different from the mediocrity we want to fix so i'm, I'm not your mother so they'll find it stressful because you called me mommy on saturday when we're having the holy ghost flu but I know surely the second big area, mom, and that one, it cannot change. So, so it's an ongoing criticism. It's not going to change. I am, um, I practice another strong uh, personal value in my life is privacy and discretion. Privacy and discretion because 
I have a responsibility to protect what God put on my inside. I'm not saying what God put on my inside is better than what God put on anybody's inside. I'm just saying the one they gave me. I, I want to be that one that the Father gave me. I want to be a just steward. I, I don't want drama. I've been saying this thing from when I was 16, that drama distracts from destiny. Everyone knows they are here. My ministry member, members know it. Drama distracts from destiny. You know, when you are driving, you are in a vehicle leading somewhere and the Holy Spirit is, is driving. You are, you're going on that journey with him. If you don't mind your lane and you want to do a joint driving collabo, they will hit your side mirror. You won't see well. They will scratch you. You know, so there are people who are not badly damaged but who have become so distressed by nonsense relationships that they are unfit for destiny. So I am in, I'm aware that there is a grace of God on my life that makes me attractive to people, but I do not make it their sentimental decisions. I'm honoring to anyone I encounter, thankful for the connections God has given me, but I'm very discerning of de definitions and I place people in those spaces. And it's not what they do to me that makes me make that decision. It's what God shows me about them. So there are people who have tried to be my friend and who have then been, who have felt like I've been cold toward them. Uh, sis, can I visit? Ah, no. Uh, well, let's, oh. let's, let's chat. I love you so much. It's just a, a packed season. I love you, you know, because I'm responsible for what God has placed on my inside. Or because we are doing ministry together, you now say I'm your covenant sister. I'm not necessarily your covenant sister. I don't know what you are covenanted on. <laughs> so again, it's okay. I will have to work careful because in life, just so that we can, we will give account. We will give account of our words, our relationships. So I can't give account of something that I'm, I don't know about. So I can't be joined to what I don't understand. So it stresses people out. And it's more stressful, mom, because I have... Uh, I have a very playful, loving, social aura. So we can laugh and play, but it doesn't mean we want to go home together. Let's meet at the event, have a good time, but we don't oh. want to go home together. So my oh. boundaries are heavy. They are heavy. Oh. In fact, my husband makes jokes about it like, the way you're hugging them now, the way you're hugging and pecking and, and giving gifts, they would think that you want to do a sleepover. You know? Yeah. So those things surely, surely. I'm, I'm really laughing hard because i'm just seeing me and you i don't know <laughs> oh god yeah and i'm just putting these things into words people don't understand but yes this is it yes, well, like, this yes. Is it. you just played me yes oh my god <laughs> Who is your mentor or who are your mentors before we close tonight? I love you so much. I, <laughs> I, love, you. What I love you. I love you. I love you. Thank you. you. Thank you, mom. It's been a beautiful, uh, beautiful experience. So my, uh, my mentors, spiritual leaders, and significant voices in my life today, um, and I will just speak to those that I have acts, direct access to because I do have uh, significant godly influences that God has used as streams to nurture the unique voice and calling on my life that I have not yet met. And mm -hmm. it's been a blessing, but I won't speak to that. I'll just speak to parents, mentors, and vessels that have really forged, um, urged me on on my journey. First are my biological parents. My biological parents are also my spiritual parents, actually. Mm. Uh, mm. Father called me just two days ago, and he came out of a dream where he, up to the, the outfit, he saw me, he saw a few things, very clear, same words. I was just like, why are you, why are you invading my space? Mm. So he's very prophetic. He's mm. lived, he's prospered. My parents are prosperous, and I'm not just talking about money. Oh. in every good way so god has blessed them and they've lived by his principles and it's worked for them so my parents oh. uh pastor dayo and ayo Adewe, i love oh. them i am proud oh. of them it's very likely that my dad is even watching no. the call. he can be quoted like that he the grandpa we all yes. know you sir. 
and Mark. Um, mm. And then there's Dr. Cindy Trim, who mm. is mm. is just a rich gift, and she's been uh, she's been my coach, she's been my mentor, and she's also been an example of the multi influential life, because mm. I've had people who. Uh, some of the things I'm also criticized for is being different things. You mm. know, who do you think you are? You know, you'd be confused. You don't know where you are, you know. But me, in Lego, because I know what, where, what I've been told. But mm. she's an example as well. And she shows me how to navigate it. Mm. You know, do it this way and all that. Um, yeah, so she's, she's surely an important part. And then uh, there is Pastor Shegun and Pastor Funke Obaji who are the founders of God's Love Tabernacle International Church, started out in Ife, it's in Lagos, multiple places in Lagos, Abuja, it's in Houston, spreading out, uh, it's in rivers, uh, different uh, cities across the world. And Pastor Shegu and Pastor Funke have discipled and parented, mentored, led me hmm. since 2001. The first message I heard of, uh, from Pastor Shegun was October 26, 2001. And both of them have together led me, shepherded me, covered me, and called out the greatness. They were the two who first ever really saw some of the things I started to see about myself uh, subsequently. Um, and then there is um, Pastor Dele and Maureen Oshumakinde, who are my senior pastors at um, the Baptizing Church, as well as Envoy Nation. The Baptizing Church is in Lagos, Ibadan, um, Abuja, multiple places as well. And they've started a work that is growing in leaps and bounds um, in, in Leicester, in the UK. It's called Envoy Nation. Yes. I also have Pastor Dotun Arifalo, who has been a mother and a voice over my life since 2007. She's the founder of Dominion House, the Fire Nation, and uh, she validates my, my fire brandness and allows, uh, challenges me to release that fire that God has placed on my inside as far as ministry is concerned. And finally, for the context, and I've spoken primarily to uh, voices regarding my call to ministry and spiritual destiny. I do have mentors for my policy work um, and what I do with business. I do have a business coach as well, who is such a blessing. But um, finally, will be Dejikumi himself. He's my consultant, my chairman, and uh, truly, truly mentors me. And I'm submitted to his leadership. What a nice, amazing, amazing. Thank you so very much for sharing this platform with me today. DDK, you are a precious gift of God to our world. And the Lord God of Israel will preserve you. I say a huge and a massive thank you to your parents for giving yes. you this yes. beautiful gift. And also to Deji. Thank you, Deji. Now, well done, oh. yes. Well done. You have done well. And your children and every yes. member of you. Thank you so very much. I'm going to bring you back. You know it. And then we're going to be talking about yes. marriage. Singles. Yes. And marriage, and, I love you know, it. Separate, uh, divorced, uh, domestic abuse, what have you. Thank you so very much. If anybody wants you to uh, mentor them or they need your materials, in one minute, can you tell us how to reach out to you? I just pinned your handle, but... Yes. Want to talk about that. Um, so Kingdom Leaders Global Alliance. I think it's Kingdom Leaders Global. Reason, and I'm sorry, Immerse, Ideation of, I'm sorry. The moment you reach uh, the ministry, they can reroute you if you want coaching, if you want counseling, we've got that in-house. If you want, um, you know, um, mentorship, we've got that in-house. Um, but if you want other things, they can reroute you to our other expressions. So Kingdom Leaders Global, absolutely. Okay. Thank you so very yes. much. I'm pleased yeah. to have a fantastic night. Um, I will. I love you. Ma. Bless you. Thank Amen. you, Global Tribe. I'll see you next week, Tuesday, by God's grace. Love you all. Good night.